Welcome. I hope you're having a good meeting so far. Uh, my name is Patricia Reuter Lorenz, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Michigan, and I'm also a founding member of the CNS Governing Board. And as a longtime colleague, frequent collaborator, and friend, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor John Janitis, this year's recipient of the CNS Fred Cavley Distinguished Career Contributions Award in Cognitive Neuroscience. John is the Edward E. Smith Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Michigan, where, fortunately for us, he's spent his entire faculty career since 1975. Since the early 1990s, John has contributed immensely to the field of cognitive neuroscience, and he's been a long-standing leader in the field nationally and worldwide. Over three decades, his theoretical and empirical work, combining cutting-edge behavioral and neural approaches, has advanced the cognitive neuroscience of working memory, executive control functions, aging, and neuroplasticity. Initially using positron emission tomography and subsequently fMRI, Janitas and his colleagues were among the very first to dissect, and I put that word in there before I knew the name of his talk, uh, uh, to dissect the cognitive processes underlying verbal and spatial working memory in the intact human brain. Along with the proposed taxonomy of executive functions advanced in his 1999 science paper with Ed Smith, Janitas' pioneering research on the neurocognitive bases of working memory is among the most highly cited and influential in the field. Indeed, these and other scholarly contributions have been recognized with numerous honors, inclu including his elected fellowship to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Association for Psychological Science, and the Society for Experimental Psychology. John was also named an APA Master Lecturer and is a recipient of the William James Fellow Award for Lifetime Achievements from APS. Beyond his scholarship, John has also advanced cognitive neuroscience through tremendous service to granting agencies, editorial boards, external advisory boards, and professional societies. Just as one key example, John served as the founding editor-in-chief of the journal Cognitive, Affective, and Behavioral Neuroscience for six years. John established functional brain imaging at the University of Michigan and has co-directed the fMRI Center with Doug Knoll since its inception over 20 years ago. Professor Genitis has also educated hundreds, maybe thousands, of budding cognitive neuroscientists worldwide through directing Michigan's summer neuroimaging course, which has been held annually since 2007. Throughout his career, John has been a phenomenal mentor to undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows, many of whom have significantly advanced our field. It has been my great fortune to experience John's impact on co cognitive neuroscience firsthand. When I joined the Michigan faculty in 1992, John provided mentorship to me when I was an assistant professor. Over the years, we've co-supervised students, written grants together, published together, and even held joint lab meetings. And as anybody who's worked with John will testify, he is truly inspiring. John is a never-ending source of exciting new ideas and a generous collaborator. At research meetings, John can be like a kid in a candy store. He gets so excited about research, it's simply contagious. And his energy and enthusiasm for science never seems to fade. I have no doubt that my career has been shaped significantly by John's inspiration, sage advice, and by our, our collaboration. I also know I'm not alone in feeling a great debt of gratitude for all he's given to the field of cognitive neuroscience. So please join me in welcoming and congratulating Professor John Janitis. Thank you, Patty. That was very kind. Um, this, uh, uh, at the risk of uh, my appearing to be uh, an award winner at the Academy Awards, I'm going to start off by thanking various people because they uh, definitely deserve it. Uh, first, the Cognitive Neuroscience Society for selecting me for this award. 
Uh, frankly, when Ron told me about it, I had my doubts about whether I deserved it, but now I've heard Patty's introduction and <laughs> sounds like it might be right. <clears throat> Um, second, the University of Michigan, where I've spent my entire career, as Patty said. Uh, university is just a font of uh, superb faculty and student colleagues uh, with whom I've had the priv privilege of working over the years, uh, and it's made an immense difference to my career, uh, as well as having collaborators throughout the university uh, well beyond psychology and neuroscience. Uh, third, to the uh, funding agencies that have been kind and generous enough to be able to support the work that we've done over the years. Uh, without that support, uh, my career would have been a lot shorter and a lot more boring. Uh, and finally, to those who've worked with me. You know, it's my, uh, it's my standard when I'm giving a talk to uh, create a slide in which I've got pictures and names in order to thank the people who've worked with me, and I've decided that that doesn't do them uh, justice. I can't thank them all, otherwise you'd be here well past dinner, probably until breakfast. Uh, so instead, what I've done is to select out those who've worked with me on the work that I'll describe today, as well as those who worked on precursors of this research uh, over the years, who've provided important foundations for the work I'll describe today. So let me ask for your patience for just a few minutes as I scroll through some names and faces so that I can give them their adequate due. As I say, this doesn't recognize everybody in the core of people who've worked with me over the years, uh, but at least the ones who are most current uh, and the ones who uh, worked on precursors of this work. Okay, let's turn to some science. Uh, the topic for today's talk is distraction uh, and its mitigation, uh, and this is going to be a very selective discussion. In particular, it's going to be an admittedly egocentric discussion because it's going to focus on the work that we've done on distraction. Uh, distraction has a very long and storied history in psychology, uh, dating back probably 150 years or so by now, uh, although I trace its modern origins to the classic paper by J. Ridley Stroop in 1935. Uh, that paper lay fallow for many years, but in the last 40 years or so, it's uh, uh, achieved a fair amount of recognition and spurred uh, a large amount of work having to do with distraction processes. So what do I mean by distraction? Well, here are some examples that came up as I was uh, spending some time preparing this talk. There were pop-ups on my computer screen that were attracting my attention, keeping me from the work at hand. Uh, I was mind-wandering about what to make for dinner that night. Um, uh, I might have been ruminating, not might have been, I was ruminating about an email that perhaps I shouldn't have sent, that I did send. There was a dog barking outside the window, annoyingly. Uh, and then there were memories of previous events that were intruding on my recall. Well, what all of these examples share in common is diversion from a task goal, something you're trying to do, uh, by goal irrelevant information, in other words, distraction. We can think of these distraction sources as falling into two categories, and this was our initial intuition. There are examples like the pop-ups on my computer screen or a dog barking outside my window, that suggested that these were distractions coming from the outside world, impacting the work that I was trying to do. And by contrast, there were distractions coming from my, let's call it, internal world. Uh, things like mind wandering and rumination, repetitive negative thinking, uh, or, uh, or proactive interference from some previous memory. 
So this classification into uh, two categories um, uh, spurred the beginning of our work on, on uh, distraction. And today what I'd like to do is to uh, tell you about three lines of work that we've done, starting with that initial work, uh, which was about a bisection of sources of distraction in uh, looking at behavioral data for internal and external sources and how we might mitigate them similarly or dissimilarly and also looking at neural data to see whether we could also um, identify some brain mechanisms that might be engaged by external or internal distraction when you're trying to overcome it. Uh, next, I'm gonna turn to a further dissection that, we've, uh, uh, that we embarked on uh, more, much more recently, uh, asking the question, are there more than two psychologically meaningful sources of distraction? Can we identify more than two sources beyond internal and external and then uh, apply uh, and then uh, collect some data that might be relevant to those distinctions? And finally, I want to turn to uh, the issue of uh, mechanism uh, more so than I will in the first uh, uh, two topics. Uh, and here I'm going to uh, describe a repurposed new technique to study the chronometric development of distraction mitigation. And it'll become clear uh, a bit later uh, what I mean by that. So let's start with the first topic, a bisection of distraction sources into internal and external, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, looking at the, both behavioral uh, effects of those and uh, neural uh, similarities and differences caused by them. So in order to, st in order to study this, we devised two tasks uh, that, that uh, we, others in addition to these two, but I'm going to focus today on two tasks that have formed a bulk of the research that we've talked about. So I need to introduce you to them. The first one we've called uh, in the literature the ignore task, and here's how it goes. You get a cue which tells you to ignore items that are about to be presented in red ink. And then in this version of the task, there are other versions also, but in this version of the task, you get, say, four words presented sequentially, two of which are in blue ink, two of which are in red ink, and you've previously been told, ignore the ones in red ink. And then you get a probe item. The probe item might match one of the ones that you should have stored in memory, like the word tree in this case, uh, because it's printed in blue and you weren't supposed to ignore it. Uh, or it might be a word that didn't appear as part of the list, in which case the proper answer is no, because it mismatches. Or it might be a word that appeared in the list, but it was a word you were supposed to ignore, in which case the proper answer is no, but we'll see that it, it's more difficult making that no response in this case because people are distracted uh, by, uh, by uh, some of these stimuli that they can't ignore. So the measure of distraction in this case is comparing two negative responses the control items and the lure, what we're calling the lure items, uh, the ones that were in the list but were supposed to be ignored. So this task, we hope, exemplifies uh, distraction from the external world because these are stimuli that are appearing and you're supposed to ignore them as they're appearing. Let's contrast this with the other task that we've used, which we sometimes call the forget task, sometimes call the suppress task. And here's how it goes. You get in the parallel version to the one I described for the ignore task, you get four words presented sequentially, two of them in red and two of them in blue, and now you get a cue that tells you forget two of the words that were presented in red. You can't anticipate which, two of the, which color you're supposed to forget, so it's only afterwards that you can uh, try to rid your short-term memory of these items that have been stored there. And once again, you get the same kinds of probes, a positive probe, an item that didn't appear in the list at all, or a lure probe, an item that appeared in the list, but you were supposed to have forgotten it by the instruction that appeared afterwards. So we have this contrast here between a task in which you're supposed to ignore external distractions that are coming in versus a task in which the distracting material already got in because you didn't know that it was distracting, and now you have to forget it. It's an internal distraction now uh, that you have to suppress. So let's take a look at some typical data from this task. Uh, can you see my cursor? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can see my cursor. So um, let's take a look here at the control trials and the lure trials showed in, uh, in salmon color and in teal color um, on the, for the ignore task and uh, uh, comparable data for the forget task. Here I'm showing re response times. Here I'm showing accuracies uh, uh, corresponding to those response times. You can see that for both the ignore task and the forget task, uh, 
Responding no to a lure item is harder. It takes longer, and you're less accurate doing it than responding to a control item also with a no response. And the same is true in the forget task. It's harder to answer no to a lure item than to a control item, and that's witnessed in both the response times and the accuracies. Uh, so we get this comparable pattern of results suggesting that we've got two sources of interference here, I'm sorry, two sources of distraction, both of which are causing interference on ongoing processing, as measured in this case by response time and accuracy. Well, having established the interference effects, we are now interested in looking into the brain mechanisms that might be engaged by these two sources of interference. And so here I'm showing you uh, brain activations that are due to external distraction from the ignore task, due to internal distraction from the forget task, uh, and this, uh, this line here, this bottom line, shows you a conjunction between those two sources of activation. And what I want to highlight here in this conjunction is a set of activations for what is often in the literature called the attentional control network. It includes anterior cingulate, it includes frontal cortex in both the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in both the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and aspects of parietal cortex also uh, posteriorly. So for both the external distraction, for both mitigating external distraction and mitigating internal distraction, there does appear to be a common mechanism that's engaged, and this is going to be a topic that we're going to get back to uh, shortly. But it also turns out that there are activations distinct to each of these tasks as well. And those are shown on this slide. Here we've got the activations, again, due to the external distraction, here due to the internal distraction, and I've highlighted here activations that differ between the two. So let me just point out some of these. In the external distraction case, you get prominent activation in occipital cortex, but you don't get that in the internal distraction case. Contrary-wise, in the internal distraction case, you get prominent activation in dorsal and, and, and inferior frontal cortex, especially in the left hemisphere, but also in the right hemisphere, whereas you get very little of that in the ignore task. So there are some sites of activation that are distinctive to whether you're dealing with um, a distraction from the external world or distraction from the internal world. But of course, functional MRI has got its limitations. It doesn't tell us about the temporal precision for when you apply mechanisms to mitigate that distraction. So we turned instead to event-related potentials in order to address that. And we had a second motive uh, in the experiment that I'm about to describe to you as well. Most of the work in my career, I focused on visual stimulation, uh, visual short-term memory, uh, visual attention tasks. And, and we wanted to go beyond that and look to see whether these distraction phenomena, the external and internal distraction phenomena, generalize to another modality as well, in particular, sound. And so we constructed uh, uh, auditory versions of the ignore and suppress task, uh, which work in a fairly obvious fashion, but I'll go through them anyway. In the ignore task, subjects are wearing headphones, and they get a signal through one headphone that tells them, ignore stimuli that are presented to that ear. They then get, as in the visual case, a succession of four stimuli, in this case letters, um, some presented to the left ear, some presented to the right ear, and they then get a cue that a probe is about to appear. And the probes are the ones that I described previously. A probe might, be, might require a positive response because it was one of the items that you weren't supposed to ignore, or it might uh, require a negative response because it never appeared in that list, or it might have been a lure probe that is one of the items that you were supposed to ignore but might have gotten in anyway. The comparable suppressed version of this task looks like this. Subjects also get a cue in the beginning, but this time it's bilateral, so they don't know which items to uh, suppress. They then get four letters, and they then get the forget cue, which is a tone in either the left ear or the right ear that tells them, forget the items that appeared in that ear. And then they get the probes again, a positive probe, a control probe that requires a negative response, and a lure probe. And once again, we're comparing the negative responses to the lure probe and the control probe to find out if there's an interference effect. Well, sure enough, there is. I wouldn't have been talking about this experiment if there weren't. Uh, and so you can see here in, on the right, I've got response time data. In the left, I've got accuracy data. And you can see that the control negative responses for both the 
suppressed task and the ignore task are substantially faster than the lure responses for both the ignore and suppress task. And likewise, in a parallel fashion, accuracy on the lure trials for both the ignore and suppress task is substantially worse than accuracy uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the control trials. So we've established now that we can get interference effects in the auditory modality parallel to those that we get in the visual modality. Now let's turn to the uh, data on temporal precision, which was one of our motivations for doing this experiment. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, ERP patterns, um, and uh, let me describe what's on the x-axis because it's not immediately obvious. Um, this C stands for the first Q that subjects get in the experiment. Then the four letters appear, abbreviated by the four L's here. Then they get a Q afterwards, uh, which in the case of the uh, suppress condition is the suppress Q. And finally, there's a maintenance interval when they have to store the information in memory, and then they get a probe. Well, um, one of the activations that we find here, one of the signals, uh, ERP signals, that we get is not surprising. We get an N1 signal every time an auditory event occurs. When a Q occurs, when one of the letters occurs, when a Q occurs, and when the probe occurs, nothing surprising there. Uh, this, after all, is an auditory experiment. Uh, but let's look um, especially at the blue line here and the red line. I'm not going to go into what the yellow condition is. It was run for another purpose. Uh, the, uh, the blue line shows activation in the ignore condition uh, uh, for um, uh, a negative going slow wave measured over fronto-central uh, electrode sites. And you can see that it's substantially elevated compared to the ignore condition when the letters are being presented. It then drops down some, although it's still elevated, uh, during the retention interval. But look what happens to the suppressed condition. Now you're getting a rise in activation in this negative slow wave during the retention interval. Well, our, inter our re interpretation of this was subjects are engaged in some kind of attentional control activity in the ignore condition when the letters are being presented. In particular, we think. Uh, dealing with external distraction, and they're engaged in an attentional control process when the uh, retention interval is in place, uh, uh, namely uh, trying to suppress items that are irrelevant, and those two uh, 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 work in uh, somewhat opposite ways. And we've got confirming evidence from this by measuring, um, oh, uh, measuring midfrontal theta uh, oscillations in the 4 to, uh, to 8 hertz range uh, uh, during the same epochs of the experiment. If we look here, when the letters are presented, the ignore task is showing great th greater theta power while the letters are being presented than the suppressed task is. By contrast, during the retention interval, when subjects have to suppress, when they have to forget, uh, theta activation is greater uh, in the suppressed task than it is in the ignore task. So this provides us with a double dissociation, we think, uh, in the timing of application of what we think are attentional control processes uh, that are engaged uh, uh, by these tasks. And I'll get back to these common attentional control processes in just a bit. So let's summarize what I know from, uh, what I think we know from the bisection uh, uh, work that we've done. We know that there's interference from both external and internal distraction. And we get similar interference for visual and auditory stimulation. It's nice that we can generalize like that. We know that there's common activation of an attentional control circuit uh, to mitigate distraction, both in the external distraction case and the internal distraction case. Uh, and we also know that the application of this attentional control circuit, if that's what the ERP data are telling us, uh, occurs at different times depending upon whether the distraction is external or internal. Uh, which uh, makes sense because that's what psychologically subjects have to do during this experiment. Uh, now, I want to turn to uh, one uh, clinical implication of internal distraction. This is not exactly a side path, but in uh, recent years, we've been concentrating a lot on translational work uh, stemming from the basic cognitive work that we've done. And so I want to tell you a little story about uh, internal distraction that uh, that we've learned from studying patients who have major depressive disorder. So the suppressed task is basically an assay of difficulty removing information from working memory. It's gotten in there, and you, then you've been told to suppress part of it, and so you've got to get it out of working memory. Well, to us, 
as we first thought about this, this resembled rumination in patients who have major depressive disorder. Because rumination involves recycling negatively valenced thoughts and events. That is the characteristic uh, uh, diagnosis for ruminative behavior. So in other words, for, um, for uh, patients who have major depressive disorder, they're getting, we thought, distraction from an internal source. But the distraction should be limited to negatively valenced information. So in order to test this, we conducted ignore and suppress experiments on patients who were clinically diagnosed as having major depressive disorder compared to healthy counterparts. And the experiment uh, used positively and negatively va valenced items, and here's a schematic of it. So in the ignore task, you're told to ignore some items. In the, suppre in the suppress task, you're told to forget some items. Uh, and the items themselves are words in this case, but words that are either negatively valenced, like kill or rape, or words that are positively valenced, like baby or smile. Is that the other? Yeah, uh, baby or smile. And so we, what we were interested in is whether the patients who had depression, clinically significant depression, might have a selective deficit in removing especially negatively valenced items from memory. So here are the behavioral data from this experiment. It turns out that the um, uh, uh, patients with depression, shown here on the right, even for positively valenced items, shown in the white bars, have greater difficulty uh, um, suppressing positively valenced items compared to healthy controls. That was news to us and interesting. But the result for negatively valenced items is much larger than that. In fact, there's a factor of three a difference between the patients with MDD and the healthy controls in how well they can uh, 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 suppress negatively valenced items. Interestingly, in this experiment, uh, there is no difference between depressed patients and healthy patients in their ability to ignore either positive items or negative items. That difference seems to be lodged in information that already gets into memory. Uh, and uh, as you can see at the top of this slide, uh, uh, we also gave these patients the Beck Depression Inventory, an assay of depressive symptoms, and we correlated their scores on the BDI with their suppression um, interference score. And uh, the correlation is much more substantial, uh, correlating it with negatively valenced items than correlating it with positively valenced items, consistent with this hypothesis that it's uh, a, a relative selectivity in ridding negative information from short-term memory. That's part of their problem. Furthermore, uh, when we look at this interference, this uh, difficulty in forgetting negative versus positive items, as a function of how much uh, the, the uh, MDD patients ruminate, uh, which you can assess using uh, what is a standard scale for this, the RRS, the Ruminative Response Scale, you can see that patients who ruminate more also have a harder time suppressing negative information compared to positive information, suggesting that there really is a tie between the behavioral work that we're doing in the laboratory and their uh, behavior in the wild uh, with ruminative behavior. So uh, naturally, we were interested in the brain mechanisms that might be involved in suppressing in healthy controls and MDD patients, and we were excited by the possibility that there might be qualitatively different brain activations for the healthy individuals and in the MDDs uh, when uh, dealing with negatively valenced items. There isn't. It turns out that roughly the same brain areas are activated for healthy controls and, and uh, depressed individuals uh, uh, when they're uh, are trying to rid their memories of, of, uh, of uh, information that has to be suppressed. But delving deeper into these data, looking especially at inferior aspects of frontal cortex, we discovered a difference between the healthy individuals and the MDDs. It wasn't in the overall site of activation, and it wasn't in the amount of activation. It was in the spatial spread of that activation. So here I've dissected out for you the inferior frontal left inferior frontal gyrus for healthy individuals shown on the right and MDD individuals shown on the left. And what's color-coded here is the um, sites of significant activation while they're suppressing. And you can see in the left, the MDDs are showing more widely dispersed activation in inferior frontal cortex compared to healthy individuals who are showing much more focused activation in one particular region. And furthermore, 
uh, there, is a, uh, there is a behavioral consequence of this. If we look at this variance in activation in left inferior frontal gyrus as a function of this interference score for getting rid, rid of negatively valenced information in memory, we see that there's a correlation. The more spread in activation you show, the more interference you show for negatively valenced information. Um, OK, so, um, so we think that the suppressed task is an assay of difficulty removing information from memory. Those with MDD seem to have poorer performance in removing negative information, which, which seems to be related to their tendency to ruminate, which is the hypothesis that led us to study MDD patients. Uh, and this seems to be mediated by somewhat different patterns of activation in at least selected regions in frontal cortex. OK, let's get to the second issue I want to take up, and that is a further dissection. Are there more than two psychologically meaningful sources of distraction? Is there more than just internal versus external? Well, we're just starting to look into this, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we've done so in a fairly obvious way. We asked people, what distracts you? And the way we asked people was by giving them a battery of 12 assays of distractibility. These are standard instruments that are used in the clinical and social literature uh, to look at what, what isn't called in those literatures distraction, but we, which we think measures distraction. And we gave this battery to two fairly substantial samples. One, a representative United States sample drawn from Prolific, the Prolific platform, and second, a completely non-representative of the US population sample taken from the University of Michigan campus. Uh, so the first thing we did was to look at a correlation matrix looking at the relationship between each one of these assays and each other one. I, of course, don't expect you to be able to see this slide uh, very well. You certainly can't see the correlation scores in the cells, and you can't even read what the, uh, uh, each of the individual instruments is. But what I do want you to notice is that there appear to be three clusters in which there are fairly substantial correlations uh, between measures, uh, and it's these clusters that led us to do an exploratory graph analysis to find out which measures of distraction hang with which other measures, which ones cluster together. So if we look at the prolific sample, uh, each one of these nodes is one of the measures of distraction, one of the 12 measures that we gave subjects. And this clustering shows you which measures are related to which other measures uh, correlationally. And what we see is that there's a cluster of items, there's a cluster of items that, are, uh, that measure external distraction. There's a cluster, large cluster of items that measure repetitive negative thinking, uh, one of which is the ruminative response scale, RRS, that I told you about just a moment ago. And there's a third cluster uh, that um, uh, measures mind wandering, uh, self-reports of mind wandering. These are all self-report measures, uh, but nonetheless, it looks as if there's orderliness to these 12 measures. They're revealing possibly three sources of distraction rather than the two that we started off our work with. Furthermore, we were able to replicate this same pattern uh, in our undergraduate sample, even though our undergraduate sample is much less representative of the United, United States population. We once again got three clusters. Well, this uh, pattern of clustering uh, led us to ask the following question. Uh, once again, this is part of the translation, my translational interest uh, in various pathologies. The question is this. We know that there is a population of people who have a, patho a, a distraction pathology. That, that, is, that is, they have um, uh, elevated differences, a uh, difficulty in being able to remove information uh, that, that is irrelevant to them. So the question we asked is, uh, are they, are these, and who am I talking about? I'm talking about patients who have uh, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So we've looked at adults with this, uh, not children. And in adults, the major symptom of ADHD is not hyperactivity, which is one of the forms of ADHD in childhood, but rather it's an attentional deficit, uh, 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 not being able to uh, avoid distractions. And so we asked, do ADHD people have a harder time with external distraction, with mind wandering, or with repetitive negative thinking? So before I tell you what the answer to that question is, I want to do a poll. 
So here's where we get audience participation. If you think that in your heart of hearts, you think uh, that external distraction is the major symptom that's most characteristic of ADHD, raise your hand. OK? Uh, if you think that repetitive negative thinking is the characteristic, most characteristic of ADHD, raise your hand. I'm hoping the rest of you vote for the third one, or I'm going to suspect that you're sleeping. <laughs> so I'll take a vote for the third one just to see if I see a show of hands. Very good. Thank you. Um, your intuitions, if you looked around the room, are that ADHD is mostly characterized by mind wandering, not external distraction or repetitive negative thinking. I have to tell you, when, when we started this work, that was not my intuition. Everything I had read about ADHD um, uh, suggested that uh, uh, patients who have ADHD were notoriously susceptible to distractions in the outside world. They couldn't stay on task when distracting things were in the world around them. Well, so how do we assess whether ADHD is uh, more related to one or another of these three uh, categories of distraction? We gave all of the subjects in our prolific sample, and it turns out in the university sample, but I'm not going to show you those data, uh, the ASRS, which is the Adult Self-Report Scale for ADHD Symptoms. It's not a clinical diagnosis, but it asks all of the items that are given during a clinical diagnosis. And the majority of you were Correct. Uh, in the prolific sample, uh, ADHD is most closely aligned. It correlates uh, most closely with mind wandering, not with external distraction or repetitive negative thinking. But of course, most of these patients don't have real ADHD. So we selected and clinically diagnosed a sample of patients who do have ADHD, and we also gave them the battery of 12 uh, inventories and also the ASRS to find out what was true of them. The same is true of them. The ASRS seems to be most closely, more closely associated with mind wandering than it is with either external distraction or repetitive neg negative thinking. In fact, uh, in, in short, my intuition was incorrect. Uh, ADHD seem to be um, mostly characterized by uh, mind wandering and in further work um, we're looking into this, but that's another story for another time. Uh, okay, so uh, in this trisection uh, part of the talk, I've uh, introduced you to a, a subcategorization of the internal sources of distraction. There might be more joints that nature has that are worth cutting, uh, and we're actually looking into this. For example, it might be that external distraction is not all of a sort, that there are different kinds of external distraction, and some are more powerful than others. We don't know the answer to that, but we're doing some work on that right now. It might also be that there are yet other sources of internal distraction, like proactive interference from other items in memory, and we're looking into that now also, but I don't have anything to report on that yet. Instead, what I want to do is to turn to uh, the final topic for today, um, mechanisms of distraction. And I'm going to do this by introducing you to a repurposed new technique to study the time-by-time uh, uh, -time development of distraction mitigation. Um, there are lots of tasks that have appeared in the literature, especially since the work of Stroop, to measure, uh, to uh, model distraction. Uh, the Stroop task, the Simon task, flanker task, anti-saccad, uh, SR compatibility, a whole bunch of tasks. Uh, what all of these tasks feature uh, a seductively appearing, appealing response, which we call a habit-based response, or you can think of it as an auto, a more automatic response, uh, that dominates a task-relevant uh, uh, response, which we call a goal-based response. Now, uh, I'm going to feature the Simon and the, uh, and the flanker tasks in the rest of this talk, and so I just want to introduce them to you if you're not familiar with them. The Simon ta in one version of the Simon task, uh, it's a very simple task. Uh, there are two responses, and an arrow can point to the left or it can point to the right. When it points to the left, you're supposed to push a left button. When it points to the right, you're supposed to put, push a right button. The trick in the Simon task is that sometimes the arrow itself can appear on the left or on the right. And when it appears on the left, even if it's pointing rightward, you're seduced into pushing the left button. That's the more automatic or habit-based response, and contrary-wise if it appears on the right. 
The flanker task uh, also has, uh, you're supposed to respond to an arrow that appears in the center of a display, which can point to the right or it can point to the left. And flanking that arrow are flankers that might point in a different direction. And those flankers are more numerous than the single arrow in the center. And so you can be seduced into making a response to an incorrectly pointing arrow in the flanking uh, uh, side. Uh, for those of you who knew about those tasks, my apology for wasting your time. Uh, OK, so the question that arises here, is there a single mechanism to control distraction in these tasks? Well, many years ago, um, several of us looked at all of these tasks that we could find in the literature uh, and uh, did a meta-analysis of the brain activations uh, that were engaged by these tasks. And what you can see in this, uh, uh, in this superimposed activation on this uh, uh, brain image here is that the activations are strewn throughout the brain. In fact, some of them even outside the brain. Uh, I hope you're laughing. I hope you're laughing. Um, well, in fact, these activations are, ac are actually more orderly than they appear on this slide. In fact, um, if you do a cluster analysis on these activations, what is revealed is this attentional control circuit that I talked about before, including right parietal cortex, right and left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, especially in the area of the frontal eye fields, and also prominently anterior cingulate cortex, which of course has been identified as a uh, site uh, that adjudicates conflict when conflict is present uh, in the environment. So given this common set of activations, it seems reasonable that all of these behavioral tasks that I just introduced you to, Stroop, Simon, uh, a Flanker, et cetera, et cetera, they all should correlate with one another because they're all revealing the, uh, a common site of uh, a, a common mechanism that, uh, that uh, mitigates distraction. Well, uh, this, is a, this is not from our work. This is taken from a paper by von Bastian and colleagues. Uh, and what this shows you is a cross-correlation among a, a bunch of these tasks, uh, like the ones that I described previously, including Stroop and Simon, a uh, couple of versions of Stroop and Simon and Flanker and so forth. Um, and you probably can't read these correlations that I've boxed in in red, so I'll simplify this by telling you that the average correlation in this matrix is 0.06 tantalizingly close to zero. Now, when I first encountered this, this fact, when I read a paper from Art Kramer's lab back in the 1980s, I was shocked by this fact. Because, I mean, if there's anything that I believed in my heart of hearts is that all of these tasks measured the same thing, namely a conflict resolution process. And in fact, in the individual difference work that we did that I described to you previously with a battery of 12 measures, when we did a latent variable analysis of those 12 measures, sure enough, we came up with the three uh, latent variables that I told you about before, external distraction, repetitive negative thinking, and mind wandering. But our latent variable model suggested that there was also a general distraction factor that covered all three of these, such that there ought to be a common mechanism. But when you look at all of these tasks that are canonical measures of of uh, distraction mitigation, uh, as I say, the correlation among them is essentially zero. Why is that so? Why is there no correlation among these common tasks? Well, there's a measurement problem. Over 80% of the studies that have used tasks like Simon and Stroop and so forth uh, rely on reaction time difference scores as their main measure. Uh, they don't often look at accuracy because accuracy in these tasks is often at ceiling. So there isn't much you can make of accuracy scores. Instead, they're mostly looking at RT difference scores. Now, we know that difference scores are notoriously variable, whether they're reaction time differences or differences between any other variables. We also know that reaction time differences often scale with baseline RT, such that the higher baseline RT is, the larger a difference is. The smaller baseline RT is, the smaller a difference is, which, of course, clouds the interpretation of different scores because you've got to scale them by the uh, overall reaction time. And finally, we know that reaction time differences uh, are notoriously variable with uh, speed accuracy trade-off functions that people internally set and that can vary from time to time and from person to person. So this makes it difficult to look into whether there's a general distraction resolution mechanism that can be measured behaviorally uh, as opposed to, uh, which is a reasonable hypothesis still, that distraction resolution is specific to each task and doesn't generalize across tasks. 
Well, uh, before I tell you about the work that we've done in order to answer this question, I want to introduce you to the driving, for I reintroduce you to the driving forces behind this work. Uh, first is Taraz Lee, who is a colleague of mine at Michigan, who uh, introduced me to this technique uh, something over a year ago. And Taraz and I have been working very closely uh, on this work ever since. Uh, second is a former graduate student of Taraz's, uh, Tyler Atkins, who got his degree as recently as a month ago. Uh, and uh, has been a, a whiz at modeling the behavioral data that I'll describe for you in just a bit, uh, and uh, uh, coming up with a, a kind of comprehensive computational model uh, to account for distraction mitigation. And third is a postdoc who's been working with me for a couple of years, Han Zhang, uh, who is a whiz of an experimentalist, uh, constructing experimental paradigms, analyzing data, and interpreting data from the task that I'm about to describe to you. And so uh, the lion's share of the credit for this work uh, goes to them. I'm kind of hanging on and uh, putting in my two cents whenever I can. So the method we call the forced response method. What it enables us to do is to get a chronometric analysis of, of distraction resolution. Or put simply, it takes reaction time and makes it an independent variable, not a dependent variable. And here's how we do it. So uh, what I've shown here is a timeline going from left to right. And uh, on this timeline, there are five events that occur. And these events occur at 0 milliseconds, 500, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. Uh, and the events that occur could be tones like beep, 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 boop. Or they could be visual signals, like I've shown here, an empty bar that gradually fills in at each 500 millisecond interval until it's completely filled. When the bar completely fills at the 2,000 millisecond interval, the subject is forced to produce a response coincident with that filling bar. That is, the response is in, has to be synchronous with that bar. Of course, people can't be perfect at this, and we give them a window to respond in, like minus 100 to plus 100 milliseconds, but their task is to be as synchronous with that last bar as possible. The stimulus can be presented uh, the stimulus can be presented at various times during this interval. So here I've shown a stimulus presented here. Uh, in this next example, I've shown a stimulus presented relatively early in the interval. So you've got time before the imperative uh, bar fills in at time 2000 uh, when you have to produce your response. So you've got processing time available to you uh, to be able to answer the question. Uh, contrast that with this case, in which the stimulus appears relatively late in the interval, so now you don't have much processing time, you're still forced to produce a response. Now, I want to convince you that this is not an easy task to do, and so in order to do this, I've got to give you some practice. We're going to have some data collection in class. Uh, uh, I need to practice, oh, so the task we're going to test you on is the uh, flanker task, just because I had to pick one. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to the flanker task first. In order to do the flanker task, raise both index fingers. What I want you to do is, I, I think I've got three flanker trials coming up. When you see a central arrow on a slide pointing to the left, press your left index finger. When you see it point, the central arrow pointing to the right, press your right index finger. Ignore the flanking arrows. Got it? OK, trial one. Good. Trial two, good. Trial three, oh, I love this one. Here's a case where you get people go, oh, and then they go like this, uh, suggesting that there really is an interference effect here, as scads of literature shows you. OK, so that's the main task. Um, that's all the practice you're going to get on that. Now I'm going to give you practice at the synchrony task, where you've got to respond at, at the time that the bar is completely filled in. Now, for ease of demonstration, I've slowed this down a bit. It's not 500 milliseconds in second intervals. They're a bit longer than that. Um, so you're, you're not as taxed here as subjects in our, in, in our experiment. So what you have to do here, I only need one index finger for this. You can rest your other one. Uh, and what I want you to do here is the bars, they're going to be two bars, one above and one below. And they're going to fill in at the same time. And as soon as they are completely filled in, that is, coincident with filling in, not after it fills in, but coincident with it filling in, that's when you put your finger down. Got it? OK. Trial one. 
Trial two. Okay, the, this is the feedback that subjects would get uh, that most of you would have gotten also uh, if they were too slow in their response. And we use this as a training paradigm. Uh, trial three. This is the feedback they would get if they anticipated the final bar, which is a tendency when you're getting a lot of too slow feedback, you want to anticipate it beforehand. OK, I think final trial. Good, good, good. <laughs> and that's the feedback you would get if you were accurate. OK, so you've gotten a bit of practice on flanker. You've got a bit, a bit of gotten a bit of practice on synchrony. Now we're going to combine the two. I'm going to give you the bars above and below, and then sometime during the presentation of those bars, you're going to get a flanker uh, uh, stimulus, and you've got to produce the appropriate response left or right. So you're going to need two fingers for this. Uh, and remember, you have to produce your response when the bar is fully filled in. Uh, trial one. That, folks, was a relatively easy trial, <laughs> partly because it's a congruent stimulus and partly because it appeared before the last interval was filled in. So buckle your seat belts, tray, tray tables in the upright position. This is going to get harder. Uh, here's trial two. Easy, right? It's harder because it's an incongruent trial, but it's much easier because the stimulus appeared well before the bars were filled in. Trial three. Good, easy again, right? Because it appeared early. Trial four, and this is the last one. Yikes. Right? That's really hard. When the stimulus appears right before the imperative signal, the filling of the bars, uh, this becomes a very difficult task. Well, um, let me show you some data from this assignment version of this experiment, and then I'll get back to the flanker task in uh, just a moment. So these, uh, uh, these two curves represent uh, accuracy, which is what's plotted here, as a function of preparation time. That is to say, this is the time between the stimulus uh, when the stimulus is presented and when the bars get completely filled in. So you can see down here at zero, that is, when the stimulus is presented right before the bars get filled in, subjects can't possibly be very accurate. And sure enough, their accuracy is uh, at about 0.5, because there are only two responses here. Then at around 200 milliseconds or so, the congruent trials, which are shown in blue, accuracy starts to rise and eventually hits an asymptote. And if we gave enough preparation time, that asymptote would be one, uh, because people would be perfectly accurate. These are the incongruent trials. And you can see what happens here. As preparation, again, uh, accuracy starts at chance uh, when people don't have enough time to process the stimulus. But as that time gets a little bit longer, say between 200 and 400 milliseconds, accuracy dips below chance on these incongruent trials because subjects have been seduced into answering the wrong answer before they start to climb and get more accurate uh, as preparation time increases. We've taken data like this, and we've modeled those data um, using a fairly simple model that's based on the idea of a competition. We argue that there is a competition between a habit-based, or a, think of it as an automatic response, and a goal-based response, or think of it as what the task is demanding you to do. The habit response is inevitably, uh, in inevitably prepared faster than the goal response is because it's automatic. It's what you've learned to do in the past. And I want you to pay attention especially to, so these, uh, uh, we've modeled this using Gaussians, uh, although we've tried other possibilities as well. And uh, uh, Gaussians are convenient because they can be described by uh, a, a mean and a standard deviation parameter. And I want you to focus especially on the mean because I'm going to bring it up again shortly. And so here I'm arguing the mean of the habit-based uh, response happens earlier than the mean of the goal-based response. When we use this simple model, to try to account for data like these, we get a fairly, fairly good fit. 
uh, of the model to the data, both for congruent trials and incongruent trials. Now, if you, if you don't want to think of this in model terms, you can think of it just kind of visually. What happens as the bars start getting filled in is that you get seduced by the left-hand arrows, and you start preparing a left response. But then, as the bars continue filling in, the goal dominates, and then you prepare a right response. So that's essentially what the model is saying. Uh, the same kind of model can be applied quite successfully, not only to the Simon task, but also to the flanker task, where you see that you get this nice dip uh, in accuracy for both tasks uh, um, at, roughly the same, at roughly the same time as well. And we've also done this experiment with the Stroop task, too, uh, another story for another time. So one question that comes up here is, how reliable is performance in this task? Uh, because, look, one of my arguments about reaction time difference scores is that they're not very reliable because different scores are, no, are notoriously variable. So does our procedure produce reliable behavior? Well, here, here I've plotted the uh, means of those hypothetical distributions uh, for the goal response and the habit response for both the Simon task and the flanker task. And what we're looking at here is the even trials in an experiment correlated with the odd trials in the experiment. In other words, this is a measure of split half reliability. We know that split half reliability in a free response task, a regular reaction time experiment, is terrible. Um, here, these correlations are pretty substantial, suggesting that the split half reliability uh, is at least orderly and maybe even very good. So one of the questions that bothered us uh, very early on in this work is whether we've done some great disservice to these uh, 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 distraction tasks by introducing this, second, this secondary task where you've got to synchronize with the bars or with tones. After all, we're giving you a dual task situation, and maybe that has completely changed performance in the main task. Our approach to answering this question, at least so far, has involved the following. We took a look, we dived into the literature and found three phenomena that, we, that are well established in the literature measuring free response versions of these interference tasks. The first is the congruency sequence effect. The CSE is the observation that congruency effects are typically smaller following incongruent trials compared to following congruent trials. So if you get a, an incongruent trial preceded by another incongruent trial, that interference effect isn't as great. And so we ran the experiment using the forced response method to see whether we got a congruency sequence effect. And sure enough, we did. Uh, when, uh, when, uh, 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 when a trial was preceded by an incongruent trial, the size of the interference effect shown by the difference between the bars was smaller uh, than it was when it was preceded by a congruent trial. Second, there's this phenomenon in the literature having to do with conflict frequency. Uh, work shows that increasing the proportion of incongruent trials leads to a smaller interference effect. And so once again, we subjected this to the forced response method to see whether we could get the same effect. And sure enough, uh, when uh, uh, incongruent trials are more frequent, the size of the interference effect is smaller than when they're less frequent. And finally, there's this phenomenon having to do with distractor salience. In the flanker task, for example, you get a larger interference effect if you increase the salience of the flanking arrows relative to the center arrow. For example, if you make them larger or you make them higher contrast. And so once again, we ran the experiment to see whether we could replicate that effect using the forced response method. And sure enough, we could. Um, more salient uh, arrows produced a larger interference effect than uh, less salient arrows did. And so uh, we think that these data uh, uh, provide some support to the idea that we haven't done great injustice to these distraction tasks. They're at least following in an orderly way uh, what the literature has shown about these distraction effects. So another question that occurred to us is whether these tasks have external validity. Uh, are they actually related to real life distractibility? So we took the Simon and the Flanker tasks and we selected individuals who were either high in distractibility or low in distractibility as measured by that adult self-rating scale for symptoms of ADHD. And uh, we gave them forced response tasks. Uh, and what we see here is that if you're 
more subject to distractibility as measured by the ASRS, you show a greater dip in performance uh, in the Simon task and a greater dip in performance in the flanker task, both of which can be modeled as a habit response that is shifted over to the left. That is, you're more prone to respond to the more autom automatic stimulus uh, 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 than you were if you're low in distractibility. It turns out that the goal response is also shifted to the left too. Uh, again, another story for another time. So finally, let's get back to this puzzle. Why the low correlation among these tasks? Well, I told you about these measurement problems uh, using re reaction time versions. Uh, and I told you that because of those measurement problems, I presume the correlation among these tasks is essentially zero. Well, suppose we have give subjects, let's say, the Simon task and the flanker task, uh, and look to see whether there's a correlation between these tasks, not looking at performance itself, but looking at our model parameters, in particular, the habit response and the goal response. Because after all, that's how we account for performance in these tasks, those two underlying parameters. And so what I'm showing you on this slide is um, uh, performance on the Simon task compared to the flanker task, looking at a goal, uh, the mu uh, parameter for the goal response and the mu parameter for the habit response. And what you find for both of these, especially for the habit response, is not a spectacular correlation, but one that's a hell of a lot higher than zero. So we think that what this forced response method has allowed us to do is to provide much more sensitivity to look at behavioral tasks that have been the canon in the field of, uh, of uh, distractibility. OK, let me sum up and, uh, and call it a day. Uh, we think we have a defensible taxonomy of sources of distraction, uh, external distraction, mind wandering, and rumination, what we sometimes call repetitive negative thinking. There are clinical implications of mind wandering for ADHD, which might have therapeutic implications as well. And there are clinical implications of repetitive negative thinking for MDD, uh, which might also have therapeutic implications. There are common and distinct mechanisms that are used to mitigate this distraction. Uh, we think that a common mechanism is a common attentional control circuit. Uh, and, but the application of this controller is to different kinds of representations, depending upon where the material is that you've got to, uh, uh, where, where the distraction is that you have to mitigate. Uh, for example, if it's in perceptual areas, uh, then uh, you would apply the controller to perceptual regions of the brain. And the, and the application of this controller happens at different times. Uh, it happens when you've got to uh, mitigate external distraction at the time that that distraction appears. It happens when you have to mitigate internal distraction when that distraction is coming uh, from memory. And we've modeled uh, this uh, uh, distractibility as a competition, as competition between relevant and irrelevant uh, distracting uh, information. And using the forced response method, rather than having just one measure of performance like reaction time, where all you get is the outcome of performance at one piece of time, we can measure performance all through processing by using this forced response method, uh, uh, given the chronometric variation that we include. Now, we think that there are more dissections that could be explored beyond uh, external and internal and beyond, say, mind wandering and repetitive negative thinking. So there's a lot of work to be done here. But for now, that's my story. Thank you. So with that, I'm sure you can agree that John Janidis is very deserving of this award. And I'm just going to read what it says on this citation here. Presented to John Janidis, PhD, recipient of the Fred Cavley Cal Distinguished Career Contributions Award, in recognition of your outstanding contributions to cognitive neuroscience throughout your career. Thank you, John. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> Thank you.